Well, for the last seven weeks, we have been in a series called Going Deeper, where we've been looking at Romans chapter 8. Most scholars would agree that Romans chapter 8 is the most important chapter in the Bible. To understand it is to understand the good news, the gospel of Jesus. Today, we are going to be wrapping up uh, that series, looking at verses 31 through 39. So we're looking at the, the exclamation point. Paul is landing the plane here on what is arguably the most important chapter in the Bible. And so if you brought your Bible with you, I want to encourage you to open it up and, uh, and find that. You can pull it up on your smartphone. Best place to track along is the Seacoast app. You can see the points and the passages. You can take notes and email them to yourself. So if you don't have that, you can catch it in the app store. But before we jump in to the text, I want us to look a little bit at the context of the passage. One of the phrases that I came away with from seminary that really changed the way that I, I read the Bible is that context is king. I think I used to open up a Bible and read the text for whatever it said, but having a better idea of, okay, who wrote it? Who were they writing to? What were they referencing? What were those people going through? All those kind of questions really help you understand what it's saying. And so today, what I would love to do with the message is kind of treat it as quiet time, uh, devotional Bible study with Pastor Josh. I'm going to kind of teach through it and talk through it much in the same way that I journaled about it. The questions that I asked, the stories or thoughts that came to mind as I studied for the weekend, and, uh, and we'll see what God does. So as we jump into it, verse 31, to give us context for it, Paul says, what then shall we say in response to these things? All right, so up to this point, he's written 30 verses in chapter 8. Uh, eight chapters so far in the book of Romans. What exactly is he talking about these things? He said so much about our life in the spirit, about the work that Jesus has accomplished. And the immediate, immediate context is, goes back to verse 28. Uh, he said, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. All right, so it's easy for us to hear all things and think, well, like all things just means all the things. But if we were to go back to verse 18, uh, Paul helps us see a little bit of the, the all things he's talking about. He says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. All right, so present sufferings, we have a little bit of a context as to what what that is, but what present sufferings is he talking about? And the, the image that came to mind for me here as I kept going back and back and back was kind of one of those uh, Delta sky maps. You know, those images of planes taken off, go into a bunch of different locations. And what we're going to see Paul do over these next eight verses is essentially recap what he said the whole chapter thus far. He keeps pointing back to truth that he's already spoken to or work that God has done already in our lives. And so what are the present sufferings? Well, in the first 15 verses or so, Paul paints a picture of two different realms, the realm of the flesh and the realm of the spirit. And much like Pastor Jack shared with us in week one, when he says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Jack said the same principle I'm kind of talking about. Anytime you read, therefore, you got to see what is the there for. And Paul had just said at the end of chapter seven, like, man, what a wretched man I am. Who can save me? Thanks be to God. Paul felt like a wretched man because of his struggle between these two realms, the realm of the flesh and the realm of the spirit. Much of our lives, your life and mine is spent in the, in the realm of the flesh. Things that we can see and taste and touch, have some measure of, of certainty of. There's times where life just squeezes us and it's hard and difficult. Our bodies break down, can be physically painful, emotional, distress, mental angst, like anxiety. Our lives in, in the body can be difficult, right? Can be painful. But we're called to be in the world, but not of the world. That we would live by the Spirit, that we would live into this spiritual realm. And so Paul's just acknowledging that for him and for you and I, like that is a, that's a struggle. Our present suffering, man, it's going to be difficult for us to do this. So much so in verses 12 and 13, he said, therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. He's acknowledged the struggle, but he's calling us, man, lean into, live into the spirit. That's where life is. 
So that's the context of the, the passage we're looking at today. So for 31 through 39, I'm going to read it to you, but I want your help just a little bit. Every time we come to the word us, I want you to say that out loud. And, and you saying that out loud, means it involves like opening your mouth and actually speaking it out loud. So feel freedom. Let me hear you. I'll read it out. You say us whenever we get to it. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for, who can be against? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for all. How will he also not along with him graciously give all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for who shall separate. We're falling. We're trailing a little bit. It's so good. Some of y'all got tired. Okay. I'm going to back the train up just a little bit. Who shall separate from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword, as it is written, for your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor demons nor present nor future nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Come on, somebody. It's like, if that ain't the brave heart of the Bible, right? I see Paul with some Mel Gibson face paint riding his horse in front of the church. Like, it's going to be hard. You may die, but you will live. You know, it's like I read this like, oh, come on. First time I read it, the number of times, us, 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 just this principle of, of repetition got me thinking like, man, for a message like this, for the exclamation point on the most important chapter in the Bible, it's easy to read that we are more than overcomers and attribute that to people other than me. But I think Paul was wanting to drive for all of us here that whether you are here as a believer and you've been walking with God for a long time and there is more for you. If you came here today on the arm, an invitation of a friend and don't have a clue what I'm talking about. <laughs> We're believing you're going to encounter the love of God and come to know that you are included in the us as well. The us is for all those who make a profession of faith in Jesus. When I first read this passage, the word that stood out to me was convinced, convinced. Paul said, for I am convinced. And then he goes into the epic Braveheart monologue. What, what are you convinced of? It can be anything like convinced that. If somebody punched you in the mouth, it would hurt. I'm like, convinced. What, what are you convinced of? Most of the things that we would say we're convinced of are in the realm of the flesh. Things that we could logically think about, reason, calculate, that we could get our hands on, that we could touch or taste or feel or see or, or hear. That word convinced, depending on the translation you use, some say, I am persuaded. Uh, but the Greek there literally means certainty, positive, convinced. And what intrigued me about the word is that he's using a word that I would largely use in the flesh for things I am convinced of, because I've seen them about a, a spiritual truth. He's convinced that nothing can separate us from the love of God. And I was like, man, how, how do we go from, I think that's true, or I hope that's true, or I believe that's true. How do I get from that place in my faith to, I am convinced Think about the, the first time you said, I love you to your, your spouse or significant other, fiance, boyfriend, girlfriend, whoever it may be. I remember when I first met Katie, it was our freshman year, first floor of the Patterson dorm. I can still see the outfit she had on, a little athletic shorts and a t-shirt. Boy, she was looking pretty. <laughs> Six guys, six girls going on this spring break trip. She was acting as the treasurer, collecting people's deposits. I had never met her. I had heard about her. I go to give her my deposit, and man, I start sweating. I'm trying. I'm like just, just in awe of her. She, I saw this life in her eyes, this joy in her voice. She was going after God. I was like, she was everything I didn't even know I ever wanted, right? And I didn't want to leave. And so 
at the time, there wasn't no social media, right? So I couldn't stalk her online. <laughs> Nobody had cell phones, but God, I wanted to talk to her as soon as I left, right? And so I did what you did back then, 2000, right? It was fall. We had just got through Y2K, so we knew the world wasn't going to end. I was going to see her another time, so I, I pulled out my pager. I was like, girl, let me give you my number. You can page me, and I will, I will cause an accident. I'll pull over so fast to call you back from that payphone, girl, you know? Like, I, couldn't, I couldn't wait to talk to her again, so I leave, and uh, knowing where the dorm was, where her classes were, I started parking different places, hoping we could, we could cross paths, you know what I'm saying? Uh, I knew what her major was. I changed some of my classes to get in some of her classes. You know what I mean? I was a good student of something in college, <laughs> namely Katie, right? So a couple weeks go by, and it took me a little bit of time to convince her that I was God's will for her life. But finally, <laughs> we started dating. And uh, the day before I met her, I was not interested or thinking or looking for a girlfriend. I was loving college, life, sports, all the things. The day after I met her, she was all I could think about. As time goes by, we're spending some time together. I start thinking like, man, I don't, I don't know that I just like, I think I, I think I love this girl. So then I start thinking like, how do I, when would I tell her that? How do I tell her that? What's going to happen when I tell her that? Is she going to say, oh, I love you too? Or is she going to say, thank you? <laughs> it's like, is that the worst response? <laughs> this epic moment? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> like, oh, God. <laughs> Till finally, I, you know, I didn't have a plan. I, I thought about it so much. We're sitting in the basement on a futon at a house in Charlotte. I had just finished watching a movie. We're at her mama's house. I'm holding her hand, right? Just been close to her for an hour and a half. The movie ends. I turned to her and like, oh, I love you. I love you. <laughs> he said, I loved you too. So it was a win. Worked out, right? But I remember I could not keep it in anymore. The Bible tells us it's from an overflow of the heart that the mouth speaks. Saying, I love you to someone. And you can get your hands on them, right? But what's happening in your body, what you're feeling, what you're experiencing, you just, you just can't, can't get your hands on it, but you're certain of it, right? They say the longest journey that a man takes is from his head to his heart. And as I read that passage and I heard, heard Paul say, I am convinced about a spiritual truth that made me question for myself, for us as believers, how easy is it for us to show up to hear the word of God, to conceptually believe the word of God, receive the promises of God, some things that we know intellectually, conceptually, but maybe they've never made their way to our hearts to where we could say, I am certain of this to the point to where we would reorient our lives, manage our lives differently because of some spiritual truth, some truth in the spiritual realm that we can't quite get our hands on. But I know that I know that it's real. Man, Psalm 34, 18 says God is close to the brokenhearted. He saves those who are crushed and spirit. I've been to some low places, many of which you've heard about, and God has met me in the pit. Low places that I brought on to, my, to myself, low places that I just found myself in, and God was in every single one of them. I'm certain that he's with me in my pain. Been unemployed before. Money had ran out. You think your, your employer is your provider because their name's on the paycheck, right? Till you find yourself without a job and not much food in the pantry. And you got to cry out to God, God, help me feed all these kids you gave me, right? <laughs> Only to see God show up. I'm serious. You find yourself at a low point and realize he is my provider. See, oftentimes it's in the struggle, the struggle of the flesh, the difficulty of life, these present sufferings that we can get so distracted by. They're so painful. It's so hard. It's so big. We can focus on them. And the truth is, you can't have a big problem and a big God. You can speak to these big problems to remember who your God is, to remember what he's called you to be, who he's called you to be, what he's called you to do. Focus on him. But all too often, man, we, we face these present struggles and they, like, they knock us back. We forget who we are in him. Paul went on, went on to ask four 
questions. Each of these questions represent a reality that I, I don't know all of them will feel as equally applicable to you, but I feel like one or two of them will stand out for all of us, that if we can really wrestle down these four realities, that it will help us lean into the spiritual realm to strengthen our resolve, to cultivate some certainty of the life that Jesus paid for, for each of us to live. So the first reality is this. Number one, I will be opposed. I will be opposed. Paul said it this way, Romans 8, 31, 32. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Paul's not saying here that nobody's never going to be against you. We're going to have people against us. We're going to have opposition. But he's saying, who is for you is just so much greater. When was the last time you faced opposition? It just felt like somebody was against you. Maybe it was a supervisor, coworker at work, and it just felt like, man, they do not want me to succeed. They do not want me to get ahead. It feels like they're just holding me down. Maybe as a group of friends, it just felt like they're against you leaving you out, don't really care about you. Maybe it was just life. Season didn't have a name on it or a person attached to it, but you just felt like, man, one thing after another, things are not going my way. Well, what Paul is saying here is that we are going to have opposition, right? But God didn't get us here to the struggle to leave us here. It made me think about uh, five years ago, we took the kids to, to Disney, which like is one of my least favorite things on earth to do and that you save up all this money, spend all this time to wait in all these lines. It's like the, especially the couples that go there, like on their honeymoon. I'm like, buddy, I got things other than Mickey on my mind for the honeymoon. You know, <laughs> so like, it's just not my, my, my favorite place. But imagine doing all the work, saving up all the money, driving all the way down, ordering the family t-shirts, getting the ears, packing up the snack bags, doing all the things, and you pull into the parking lot. And they're like, welcome to Mickey's Magical Kingdom. That'll be $35 to park. Imagine being like, what? This is ridiculous. This is too much. I'm out of here. You know, it's like, no, we've done all the work to get to this point. Of course, we're going to pay the $35. Well, what Paul is saying is God already did the big work in the sending of his son. One person is so grateful for that, right? Come on. We can get excited about that. The point is, he's done the big work. He died on the cross for your sin. Will he not also help you get through the opposition you faced? Will he not also stand for those who are against you? Man, when we're feeling opposition, when we feel people are against us, it doesn't need to surprise us. It doesn't need to consume us. It doesn't need to knock us back how it does. We can know this is going to be a part of the journey. It was for Paul. It was for Jesus. Hebrews 12, 3. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Man, in the face of opposition, it is all too easy for us to grow weary and lose heart. But we can settle it as a reality. It's a reality of the realm of the flesh. But that is not make up my world. So number one, I will be opposed. Number two, I will be accused. Turn to your neighbor and say, man, this is encouraging. <laughs> I will be accused. When was the last time you were accused of something? Maybe you're driving up the road. You're like, oh, gosh. You pull over. Mr. Walters, you know why I pulled you over today? I was like, I was going too fast, too close to the red light. I didn't stop at the stop sign like all of them will do. And they're like, no, your tags are expired. It's like, oh, perfect. You know, like, of course they are. Whether you're accused of something that you actually did, or someone has accused you of something that, that you didn't do, that's not accurate. I did not do that. Maybe it's no one else, but it's, it's you. It's the voice inside of you. You said, man, I'm going to start working out. Alarm went off the next morning. You were like, I'm going to do that tomorrow. I'm not. <laughs> you're driving to work, and the, the voice in your head is, man, you are lazy. You are not going to change. And the evidence proves it. You're like, you're right. I am. It's like, man, accusations from outside of you, from inside of you can just fill you with shame, can derail you, can discourage you. We are going to be accused. Paul said it this way. 
Who will bring up any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. See, accusations have a way of leading to condemnation, guilt, and shame in our own hearts. And Paul is saying, hey, you're going to do things worthy of accusation. You're going to be accused in times where they're not real or valid, but you need to remember in the realm of the spirit, it is only God who justifies. He doesn't look over your, your sin and struggle. He doesn't just dismiss it, but you are justified just as if you'd never sinned because Jesus took your sin upon himself. He who knew no sin became sin that we might become the righteousness of God. He paid the price for my sin in full. The wages of sin is death. Jesus took that death upon himself so that I could be justified in the flesh. When people accuse you or falsely say all kind of evil against you, you don't have to wear it as a, a badge or a label. You don't have to take it on yourself, but you can settle, man, this is going to be a reality of my life. It was for Jesus. Matthew 27, 12 through 14. When he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate asked him, don't you hear the testimony that they are bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge to the great amazement of the governor. Jesus knew what was in the heart of a man. And he could have had an epic Jesus brave heart moment, called down armies of angels, pow, you know, like destroy these guys. But he didn't even speak to their accusations. And so often, and you, you let me get accused of something, even if it doesn't come out of my mouth, in my mind, I'm trying to defend myself, honor myself. That wasn't my heart. That wasn't my intent. I didn't mean to do that. Why would you let, you know, it turns to anger. Why would you label me as that? Why would you think that, say that? We can be so quick to speak to and defend. It is God who justifies. We don't have to let the accusations of others derail us. I will be opposed. I will be accused. Number three, I will be judged. Romans 8, 34. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. And when we do things wrong in the flesh, when we fail, when we drop the ball, especially in our culture, people can be so quick to point the finger, to judge, to condemn. And if we're not careful, man, we can, we can get on the bandwagon with them, whether it's a Facebook post or a casual conversation. And the truth is, at some point, man, we're all going to be the people who mess up. I saw an interview a couple years ago from uh, Nick Saban, whether you love him or hate him. He was the coach of Alabama for 17 seasons, led them to six national championships. I want to check, I want you to check out a little bit of this press interview he had. There, there's always a lot of criticism out there. When somebody does something wrong, everybody wants to know how you're going to punish the guy. All right, but there's not enough for 19 and 20 year old kids, people out there saying, why don't you give them another chance? All right, so I'm going to give a speech right now about this. Like, where do you want him to be? Guy makes a mistake. But where, where do you want him to be? You want him to be in the street? Or do you want him to be here graduating? You know, when I was over there at the Nagurski, Musin Muhammad, who played 15 years for the Carolina Panthers, played for me at Michigan State. Everybody in the school, every newspaper guy, everybody was killing a guy because he got in trouble and said there's no way he should be on our team. I didn't kick him off the team. I suspended him. I made him do stuff. He graduated from Michigan State. He played 15 years in the league. All right, he's a president of a company now. And he has seven children, and his oldest daughter goes to Princeton. So who was right? I feel strong about this now, really strong, all right, about all the criticism out there of every guy that's 19 years old that makes a mistake, and you all kill him. And then some people won't stand up for him. So my question to you is, where do you want him to be? You want to condemn him? Whether you're 19... Whether you're 19 or, or 29 or 49, man, somebody makes a mistake in the light. It's visible. It's so easy to point a finger and judge him. He shouldn't be on the team. You should kick him off. He doesn't deserve to play. And you know what that sounds an awful lot like? Crucify him. 
Crucify him. It's like, man, we read scripture and think, how in the world could people have ever rallied behind Jesus to, to do that to him? And truth be told, so often in our culture, we do it to people all the time. When truth be told, at some point, you're going to be the 19-year-old, the 29-year-old, the 49-year-old that is messed up and needs another chance. And what Paul is saying here is that, hey, go ahead and settle it. You are going to be judged. It was true in Paul's life. It's true in Jesus's life. Luke 7, 34, the son of man came eating and drinking. And you say, here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. We are going to be judged. We are going to be condemned. And we can let our experience in the flesh drive our reality and the spirit if we want, but it's going to keep us from experiencing the fullness of life that Jesus paid for. Here as Paul is landing the plane in this chapter, he's pointing back to everything that's been done just to say there is more for you. For the believer, man, if there's areas where you're getting caught up in one of these realities, opposing others or being opposed yourself, coarse talk, accusing others or being accused yourself, having a judgmental spirit, judging others or maybe being judged yourself, ultimately you are the one that's going to pay for it. We're called in the world, but not of the world. Remove yourself from this momentary struggle and suffering to step into the fullness of life that he came to offer. There is one who justifies. There is one who judges. It's been settled in Jesus. He's paid the price in full. We don't have to carry that shame. We don't have to carry that guilt. So I will be opposed. I will be accused. I will be judged. But number four, and most importantly, I will be loved. I will be loved. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? He says who, but then he answers with what? A series of of what's of things that we all experience in the flesh. That is a struggle. We go through these things in our bodies. These, These vessels that are broken and hurting. And it's so real, it's so big and so hard that it can distract us from what is even bigger, what is even greater. As it is written, for your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced. I am convinced I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. When you think about the things that you are convinced about in the realm of the spirit of your life in Christ, are you convinced of his love for you? You didn't earn it. You don't deserve it. There's no resume in the flesh realm you can point to that's worthy of it. It is a free gift. He so loved you in your sin and separation from him that he sent his son to die on the cross for your sin. And all you have to do is believe in faith that Jesus died for you, that he paid that price, and you can have a relationship with God through him. The Tour de France wraps up today. And uh, if you've ever watched it on TV, each time uh, a team of cyclists go out, there's a a pace car that the race director is in. And while the car is in front of all the bikers, it's not a very exciting race. You know, they're all in a pack. They're all together. But there comes a point where the race director pulls over. And that's when the race gets exciting because bikers can start breaking away. There's nothing separating them from from the finish line. The only thing keeping them from making a move, from really going for it, is themselves. And the same is true for you and I in Christ. The the barrier, the division has been removed. The only thing keeping me from having a relationship with God is me. So the invitation for you today, have you made that decision for yourself? Are you certain of your eternity? Are you certain of his great love for you? Let me pray for us. God, I'm so thankful for your patience with me and the reality of my struggle in the realm of the the flesh. 
the times that I'm so easily distracted and derailed by my experience in this life, by the way that people hurt me, by my failures, by my inner monologue, by the names that I'm called. I live as though this is it. So often distracted and discouraged. I repent of that for myself and for all of us and acknowledge that you paid the greatest price. You gave your life so that we might be a people who are free, a people who are forgiven, a people who take hold of the rich, full, and satisfying life, the abundant life that you came to offer. So that I pray today for all those that are going to step into a relationship with you for the very first time, and I pray for each of us as believers, if there's places that we get hung up because of our experience in the flesh, God, help us, as Paul shares in this text, to be more than overcomers. Help us to overcome. Help us to be victorious, not just in heaven one day, but today. Help us to dismiss the pain. Help us to dismiss our, our judgment of ourselves and others. God, to focus and go hard after you. In Jesus' name, amen.